Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, EMR International League Against Epilepsy webinar. Uh, uh, it is Friday evening, uh, very lovely evening. Uh, so our speaker today will be Dr. Tashka. Uh, Dr. Tashka Wilms has always had an interest in special need children. She obtained her PhD in molecular biochemistry genetics at the Old Rand, Rand African University, after which she studied nutrient uh, dietetics at the University of uh, Pretoria. Her field of interest in neurological and genetic disorders such as epilepsy, autism, and inborn error of metabolism. She had been working alongside Matthew Friends for more than 20 years and had private practice in Pretoria. She had published several publications and had given presentation and workshop both locally and abroad. She has great results with classic uh, ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, and uh, adapted low glycemic index diet. Uh, and our uh, she's going to talk to us today about dietary treatment for intractable epilepsy and any of the three diet used ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, and adapted low glycemic index diet uh, during this evening. Uh, there will be uh, so please uh, use the Q and A during your the presentation, and at the end of the presentation. All of your questions will be answered uh, by Dr. Tashka. So, Dr. Tashka, the floor, the mic is yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me tonight um, and for the opportunity for me to share with you the ketogenic diets that we use by treating epilepsy and other disorders as well. I think Lucretius hit the nail on the head when he said 95 to 55 years before Christ, what is food to one man may be a fierce poison to others. So as you all know, there are a variety of causes of epilepsy. It might be due to a small number of patients, approximately 10 to 15 percent, who has suscept the susceptibility or predisposition to develop seizures in an inherited way. But in most, most cases, it's due to a brain insult, whether it's, head, whether it's head injury, hypoxic brain injury sustained from a birth complication, infection of the brain, such as meningitis or encephalitis, brain tumors, strokes, prolonged convulsions in childhood, and immune errors of metabolism. Now, I find this very interesting because immune errors of metabolism is my other field of speciality. And I found in a few of my cases, when the clients or the patients bring in their children with generalized epilepsy, and we dig a bit deeper, we actually find that the epilepsy is due to um, an untreated inborn error of metabolism. And then also in about 40% of cases, it is unknown. The ketogenic diet has been shown to be especially effective in Dravet syndrome, Du syndrome, infantile spasms and West syndrome, Lenglas Gastel syndrome. It's also the only treatment for GLUT1 deficiency because the brain cannot take up the glucose and you need to look for an alternative source of fuel, hence the ketogenic diet to produce ketones. Also, in the case of pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, some cases of autism and brain cancer. Then the newest studies has also started to focus on this. There's not a lot of research with this, but there is ongoing studies to show that neurodegenerative disorders associated with mitochondrial dysfunction and metabolic abnormalities, such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and amyotropic lateral sclerosis, and also neurocognitive disorders such as TSC, might benefit from the ketogenic diet. So if we look at the types of diet, so the ketogenic diet therapy first emerged in the 1920s, and this was before most anticonvulsant drugs were discovered. The first study to show it as an effective therapy for adults was only published in 1930. Despite positive results, it was almost 70 years before another study reported similar findings. 
However, many studies report that adults struggle more in maintaining a ketogenic diet long term. And the reason for this is, is because it's a very, very restrictive diet. You work from certain recipes, the calories are calculated, um, you have to weigh off everything. It is a very strict regime. Then we have the use of more liberal modified ketogenic diets that made this therapy a far more practical, uh, practical possibility for adults. And the two diets that we have here includes the modified Atkins diet and the adapted low glycemic index diet. So if we look at the background of the ketogenic diet therapies, the classical ketogenic diet is a therapeutic diet used in the treatment of intractable epilepsy. So as you know, the anti-epileptic drugs are designed to control the seizures and not to cure them. Um, only 20 to 25% of their first medication will respond to the second or third drug. And there is around 10 to 15% of children that do not seem to respond to any anti-epileptic drug. So the worldwide trend is typically that the ketogenic diet is tried only after three or four drugs have failed. However, said that, in some of the cases where we know the ketogenic diet is very effective, such as West syndrome and um, Dravet, some of my neurologists actually prescribe the ketogenic diet as the first line of defense. So why do the ketogenic diets reduce, reduce seizures? And we are still not certain exactly why, but there are a few hypotheses out there. So during a seizure, networks of neurons fire when they are not supposed to. Now this can be due to more excitable, um, excitable brain cells with increased excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate, or neighboring brain cells can't suppress the spread of excitability like normal by using inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA. So what the ketogenic diet does, it reduces the amount of glutamate in the brain and it enhances synthesis of GABA, making it less likely for a seizure to occur. Recent studies examined how the ketogenic diet can alter the gut microbiome. So this is the microorganisms inhabiting the digestive tract. They have found that the ketogenic diet can increase certain bacterial species that promote an increased proportion of GABA to glutamate in the brain, and that the ketones can also reduce inflammation in the brain that may trigger seizures. So the ketones, ketone bodies per se increases the production of energy in the brain, making it a more stable neuron. It stops the neurons from firing through the opening of certain ion channels in the cells. But also there's prevention of cell death. So seizures can cause damage or even cell death in the nervous system. The ketogenic diets increase the levels of a particular gene that protects these cells from dying. So beta-hydroxybutyric acid can be used by the brain and the liver as a source of energy. Now this specific ketone body is measured in the blood. Acetoacetic acid is the one excreted in the urine. So when you do a blood test and you do a urine test, you're going to um, look at the values of two different ketone bodies. So most studies have shown that 50 to 75 percent of children on the diet have considerable improvement in their seizure control. And the randomized control trial published in 2008 showed that 38 percent of children on the ketogenic diet had a greater than 50 percent reduction in seizure activity, 7 percent greater than 90 percent. In my practice, I think it's because I'm a little bit more pedantic. Um, in the keto centers aboard, they only go there on three monthly or six monthly visits. In my practice, I ask my patients to send me monthly updates. So if something goes wrong, I can immediately rectify it. So in my practice, around 30% of children are seizure free. Then I've also got the majority of kids that's got a, um, a, a decrease in seizure activity between 50 and 90 percent. And then you get the non-responders. But a non-responder does not mean they do not respond to the ketogenic diet. It's just that the reduction in the seizures is approximately 10 percent. And then, you know, to, to, to do this type of strict, strict diet for only that amount of efficacy might not make the diet the best way to use. So. It's very important that the patients realize that the ketogenic diet simulates the metabolism of fasting. It is not a starvation diet. That is usually the first thing when people think about the ketogenic diet. It's either banting, what people are doing outside in the street, 
or it's a starvation diet, but it mimics the process of starvation. So it's a very high fat diet, it's approximately 85% of the total energy, very low in carbohydrates, approximately 5% with adequate protein content to ensure optimal growth and development. So there's a misconception that people believe the ketogenic diet is a high protein diet. It is an adequate protein diet to ensure that optimal growth and development takes place. Now, due to the low carbohydrates and the low glucose metabolism, the high fat content of the diet results in fat being the major source of energy. Ketone bodies are produced as a byproduct of this fat metabolism, and then the body goes into a state of ketosis. So the moment the clients come to me, we do an initial assessment. Um, we do the weight and the height. So for the classical ketogenic diet, the, the diet is calculated on a gram per kilogram basis. It's not an estimation or a, uh, or a, cal a calorie non-restriction. Everything has to be calculated on the child's weight. We do biochemical indicators to determine the baseline, such as the lipid profile. We do liver function, kidney function. Also a diet history to determine food likes and dislikes. I'm not sure how many of you have actually seen the recipes of a ketogenic diet, but there's a certain amount of ingredients that you put in this recipe and then you adapt the diet so that it fits in. So if there's a specific food item the child refuses to eat, it messes up the whole calculation of the ketogenic diet and it starts changing the ratio and then it's futile. So for, for somebody to say that they can actually calculate the ketogenic diet by hand, is, is, is I should be very careful with that because the software is so intricate that we use software planning to do the, the recipes. So I make sure that I know everything that I plan into these recipes is something that the child likes and do not dislike. And then also we have to determine the parents' goals and expectations or even the client's goals, whether it's an adult or a teenager and their attitude towards change. This is going to be the indicator of what type of diet to use. If I'm sitting with a child that's got seizures, my, my worst child was about 280 seizures a day, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. The ketogenic diet is the way to go. But if you're sitting with an adult or an adolescent and they're a little bit rebellious and you know they are not going to stick to this diet 100%, then you would rather um, prescribe the modified Atkins diet or the adapted low glycemic index diet, which is a little bit more um, flexible for them to, to use. So education is crucial. So I teach my clients foods that can and cannot be used into the ketogenic diet, so all the keto-friendly food. And then I must say, I thank everybody out there for doing banting because this has brought in a new whole group of food products that's low carb that my ketogenic patients can use. We do growth monitoring in the, in the case of children. We monitor the ketone and the glucose levels, seizure frequency and intensity, and also the blood works. So the biochemical indicators that we do, baseline prior to the diet and then every three months and if we're satisfied it can continue after six months then. We look at the lipid profile because as you all know there's a transient increase in the cholesterol levels of these kids but the moment they go off the diet and they wean off the cholesterol level stabilizes again. Corrected calcium levels um, because the dairy intake is very little, so we need to make sure that their calcium levels are adequate. Liver function, iron profile, and then the serum albumin levels. We also educate them on the side effects of the diet and how to alleviate it. But the nice thing is, all the side effects are manageable, such as constipation, we can treat with liquid paraffin or psyllium husks, or there's a lot of things we can do with that, suppositories, um, the nausea, the moment they get, we can start with a lower ratio and then work, work up to a higher ratio. But we also need for fine tuning of the diet. So we start off with a specific diet and then According to the feedback that we get from the clients, we fine tune to see where the sweet spot is, what would work for them. Also supplementation, and then we give them a list of support networks and peer reviewed research. So matthewsfriends.org is an international um, non-profitable organization. This is the best web website to go on to. They've got a medical panel on there. There's a whole um, uh, uh, 
place there for all the medical professionals. They've got all the research studies on there. There's a blog for parents. There's recipes. It really is amaz amazing. But also Charlie Foundation, the Kayla Foundation, also neuroketo.com. So if you look at the classical ketogenic diet, in the past, we initiated the ketogenic diet in hospital where the kids were fasted for 36 to 48 hours, after which the diet was introduced under close supervision. But this caused a lot of trauma because you can imagine if you're sitting with a child with a normal, normal brain function, it's just the seizures, and they're sitting in a ward with other children and they are not getting any food. It was very traumatic. And also, it's, it takes a toll on the medical aid as well. So new research has shown, but it's not that new, it's actually about 10, 12 years old, that fasting and admission is not necessary to reach ketosis. So what I do in my practice, prior to the consultation, I ask the parents to eliminate all sweets and cold drinks from the child's diet and to decrease, not stop, the portions of starch. The reason why we don't stop the portions of starch is they go into ketosis very fast. You, it's, it's really insane. So um, I don't want them going into ketosis without them knowing how to monitor the ketones and what to do if the ketones go too high and so forth. And then I tell them to start adding more fat to the food, adding butters to the food, adding oils to the food, so sort of to prep the tummy on the high fat content. So the keto recipes are then introduced once they are calculated using the Stanford Meal Planner or the EKM calculator. And some of my patients, when they are comfortable with the diet, they are taught how to use the software in order to calculate their own recipes. So I work with a lot of clients abroad, and some of them um, is in Zimbabwe, some of them are in Mozambique, some of them are in other countries as well. And they don't necessarily have the range of food items that I sometimes use in the recipes. So then it's easier for them, if I teach them how to do the recipes, that they can put in their own ingredients and the local sources they can get to create their own recipes. So recipes are then calculated on the following principles. The ratio of the diet. Now the ratio of the diet is the amount of fat to the carbohydrate plus the protein content combined. So a four to one ratio means there's four grams of fat for every one gram of protein and carbohydrate combined. Now this is the one most often used, but the trend is changing. So we are starting with a lower ratio, like a three to one, and then work the ratio up. The reason being, we actually see the same efficacy on a lower ratio, and also, it makes the compliance of the diet a bit more easy because there's more carbs allowed. And if we see control, but it's not quite where we would like it, we can always move up to a 4 to 1 ratio or even a 3.5 to 1 ratio. Where we do use a 3.1 ratio is in children younger than one year. So a lot of people do not want to use the ketogenic diet in infants, but we have great success with the ketogenic diet in infants. The only side effect or the problem that we're sitting with is the risk of hypoglycemia. But there's a few tweaks that we do. So we, re we reduce the, the ratio of the diet and we also increase the frequency of the meals and then they don't have any hypos. Also in the case of overweight children, so we literally want the body to use its own fat to burn ketones and not only that from food, fussy eaters to make it a little bit more compliant and then frag fragile medical conditions. So the adequate protein is given to ensure optimal growth and development and it's usually calculated as a one gram per kilogram um, amount. But the moment they are wasting or low albumin levels or in kids younger than a year old or when your gut feel knows that there has to be more protein, we can increase the protein content. Now to give you an idea of what ketogenic diet food looks like, because a lot of people think, oh my word, it's just like strawberries and cream or it's only like this horrible fish and a little bit of salad with like a little cup of oil that you have to drink with it. I want to show you some pictures of what a ketogenic diet looks like, and I got this from my patients. So the avo boat is divine. So the avocado is going to be the main source of fat. We've got the chicken as the protein, and then the mayonnaise is also going to contribute to the fat. And then she's put in little pieces of apple for the little bit of carbohydrate. Bacon and egg. On the side there, you'll see a little slab of yellow. That is a slab of butter. <laughs> I always tell my parents, 
please do not pull a face. Because the moment you pull a face and the kids say, it's like, all right, no, I don't want to eat it. Mm -mm, I'm done. But kids actually love butter. If you give it to them to eat like that and you don't make a fuss, out about, a fuss about it, they will eat it very happily. Um, we can also make waffles. And like I said, thank goodness for the banting movement because now we've got almond flowers, we've got flaxseed flowers, we've got so many low-carb flowers to use or any um, exoflays. We can even make brownies, and they are the most delicious brownies ever. Not so good for me and you, because they're very high in fat and cholesterol. If we're going to have it, we're just going to gain weight. Um, we got an example of cheese and salami um, cartwheels, pancake made with a hazelnut chock filling, and then a salmon salad. So the side effects of the diet, like I've mentioned, it's easy to alleviate as well. So we usually sit with nausea. Um, and to, to treat that is either time or lower the ratio of the vomiting continues. Constipation is our biggest, biggest um, side effect because the fiber is being taken out of the diet. So we can use glycerin suppositories. Um, MCT oil has got a, um, a lubricating effect in itself. We can use probiotics, but we have to be careful that there's not a lot of prebiotics in the probiotics because the prebiotics like inulin or um, phosphatoligosaccharides is actually a carbohydrate source and would contribute to the carbohydrate content of the diet and we can use psyllium husks. The hypercholesterolemia, because I'm in control of the recipes, I can literally choose the, the right types of fats to use. So I try and steer away from the saturated fats and focus more on the essential fatty acids. The possibility of kidney stones, I've only had one child with this and it was due to a secondary inherited disorder. So when the kidney stones form, and that's this is one of the, the, the um, fears of the doctors, is because the calcium level is so low, because we don't take in a lot of um, dairy because it's high in carbohydrates, what happens is the body pulls the calcium out of the bones because the calcium has to be in homeostasis in the blood to make sure the heart beats and muscle contraction. And when that happens, you get crystals that form. So the way to treat this is with a calcium supplement and enough fluid. Hypoglycemia, very easy to treat with frequent meals and adequate calories. The ketoacidosis, we decrease the ratio, treat it with fruit juice. And there is some cases where they've reported cardiomyopathy. I've, in my 20 years of practice, never seen this, but selenium is the supp supplementation prevents this. Then the very important thing is, because the ketogenic diets are considered as an anti-epileptic drug, so I don't know if you guys know that the medical aids actually pay for the ketogenic diet. So for a lot of the things that's got nappy codes, like the Nutrition MCT oil, um, the KetoCal, which is like um, a ketogenic formula milk, like almost like Ensure, but the ketogenic version, um, the, the ketone strips, the glucose strips, all of that, they actually um, uh, authorize that to pay for it. But because it's considered as a drug, we have to treat it like a drug. So when we stop the diet, we cannot stop completely. We have to wean the patient off the diet. And I've seen this once in my practice, or I heard about it from um, somebody who I took 20 years ago when I took the practice over. Is she had this little girl that was seizure free. She went on the diet for two years, perfect. And they weren't so certain about the weaning off part because she's seizure free. And she was told that she can have food as normal again. And within a week, the seizures came back again. And the mom just said she cannot go through this again. And it's, it's just too hard. And she was so demotivated, disappointed. But the moment we wean off the diet, we slowly and gradually increase the carbohydrates over time. It takes about six months if you really go, go with a reduction of 0 0.5 to 1 increments at one or two monthly intervals. If it's a child that's responding very well, we can, do, we can make it a bit faster, but patience is of the utmost importance because when they get to this end mark of two years, it's like I'm done with this diet and then they, they can mess up everything they've done in this two years just by being impatient and trying to introduce foods too fast. So in the case of the ketogenic diets, the carbohydrates are limited, and this means a low intake of micronutrients. So supplementations are crucial for all the types of ketogenic diet therapies. 
So we need a carbohydrate-free multivitamin and mineral with low levels of vitamin D, uh, vitamin A, and enough selenium. Um, so we are very careful of syrups because syrups usually contain sugar. Um, if you have something like an effervescent, that contains carbohydrates. Um, also a calcium and a phosphate supplement. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but you can never have enough calcium and phosphate in a multivitamin. It's, it's an, it's, if you look at something like Minocal 7 or Minoq7, it's a humongous ball. So the calcium takes up so much bulk of this um, vitamin that you can never mix the other vitamins with it. And it will also interact with the absorption of the other vitamins. So you always need to take it as a separate supplement. In my practice, we use L-carnitine. There's controversy about the L-carnitine, but I see great success. Because what the carnitine does, it takes the fats and it pulls it into the mitochondria and it converts it into ketones. But there's also a beneficial effect of the carnitine. It helps to stabilize and lower cholesterol level. The secret is just you cannot get L-carnitine over the counter. So I import um, compound uh, from a compound pharmacy, therapeutical grade L-carnitine. It's like a crystalline powder that is pure because the moment um, it's extremely water soluble, like super soluble. If you open up the package and it's like a cloudy day, it will absorb the liquid out of the air and the whole bottle will become a liquid. So what the pharmacies do, they put binders and fillers in there so it doesn't solubilize that easy. But then the efficacy is not that good because it can't remove itself from that metabolites. So the L-carnitine that I use is a pure carnitine that we dissolve in a bit of water and we spread it out throughout the day because remember because it's so hypersoluble if your child or the adult or something takes everything at once they're going to urinate it out within two hours I need a continuous spread of carnitine throughout the day so in some of my cases when some of the dietitians phone me and they say yes but this child has got diarrhea which is crazy because he's in the ketogenic diet I would ask them how much carnitine are you giving and in how many dosages and it's usually when they give it in one dosage so carnitine at in one dosage can also cause diarrhea or a nappy rash and then we have to supplement the essential fatty acids especially omega-3 the DHA and the EPA it's crucial to monitor ketone and glucose levels so the reason for this is we have to prevent hypoglycemia especially because these kids are not hospitalized. We also have to prevent ketoacidosis and we have to make sure the child is in ketosis. So um, we have got uh, glucometers from Abbott that measures both blood ketones and blood glucose values. So the nice thing about the blood is the moment you measure the blood ketones, you have an immediate indication of what the levels are in the brain. So blood glucose levels for optimal seizure management, about 3 to 3.5 millimoles per level, a per liter. So the doctors that don't know the kids are on a ketogenic diet usually get a heart attack because they think the kids are going into a hypo. But remember, we don't want the glucose. We want more ketones. So the moment the glucose falls under three, that's when we intervene. But it's perfect at levels of three and 3.5. Optimal ketone levels is between four and five millimoles per liter. And then what we can do, so in the past, before we had this glucometers, we measured the ketones in the urine. But the problem with the ketones in the urine is it gives an indication of the value of the ketones the past 12 hours. So if I get a value now, I cannot say with certainty, this is the value in the brain now, or was it 10 hours ago? So we only use the urinary strips to see is the child in ketosis or not. So it's not very accurate and it also depends on the amount of fluid taken that day because if the child took in a lot of fluid, the urine is going to be diluted, you're going to get a false reading. If the child didn't take any fluid, it's going to be concentrated um, urine and it's going to look like a strong positive and then it's not accurate as well. Wow. So the modified regimes. The advantage of the modified regime, regimes is the flexibility of meal choices due to the focus around carbohydrate counting. So it's a good option for older children, teenagers and adults who are consistent eaters and willing to count and monitor the carbohydrate and fat intake throughout the day.
So if we first look at the modified Atkins diet, so the modified Atkins diet follows similar principles to the traditional classical ketogenic regimes. It's very low in carbohydrates, high in fat. It's got a similar effect in altering the balance of fuels available for energy production in the body. And in 2003, the team at John Hopkins um, in Baltimore, USA, discovered that a modified version of the Atkins weight loss regime could produce nutritional ketosis and influence seizure symptoms. So the following are key aspects of the original USA modified Atkins protocol. The carbohydrate intake is initially restricted to 10 grams per day for children and 20 grams per day for adults. But this carbohydrates need to be spread throughout the day. So I usually tell people to spread it in three um, separate meals, like for instance, three grams and three grams and four grams, if it's a 10 gram restriction. Because if you're going to give all of the 10 grams at once, you're going to get a sugar spike and then it defies the purpose of the diet. Also, this relates to the available or the net carbohydrate and it excludes the fiber. So this makes it a little bit different than the, glo the glycemic index diet, which includes the fiber. So this one excludes the fiber. So we encourage high fat foods to be eaten um, at each meal and snacks. Proteins are allowed freely and there's no restriction initially. Um, I, I'm very wary of saying this because then you're almost moving into the field of banting. It's just eating fats and proteins and limiting your carbs. Um, the, the problem that you're sitting with, if you've got a very high caloric intake then by eating so much fats and proteins, you might start gaining weight. So it's very crucial for me to start the diet and then get their weight measurements. And if their weight increases, I do put them on a calorie restriction when that works with an exchange system to say, okay, please don't exceed so many fats per day and so many proteins per day. A vitamin and mineral supplementation is also necessary, also due to the um, restriction of the carbohydrates. So in 2002, the team at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston, USA, started using a novel modified regime that shifted the emphasis towards glucose control rather than simply targeting ketosis. So the ketogenic diet leads to flat and stable blood glucose levels. A spike in the blood glucose due to extra carbohydrate consumption or due to the rate of release of a specific carbohydrate can trigger a significant increase in seizure activity. So the low GI therapies combines what is known about the vary, varying speeds of um, glucose absorption from the foods. This is the glycemic effect of the foods and the glycemic index, which we, we call the GI, with a level of carbohydrate restriction that still requires the body to burn fat as its main energy source. So studies in children and young adults indicate a similar level of effectiveness, but improved compliance in comparison with traditional ketogenic regimes. So the key aspects of this is the carbohydrate intake you will see is much higher. It's restricted to 40 to 60 grams per day, also evenly distributed to the day, but this figure includes the fiber content. So when we look at the carbohydrate choices, it's restricted to foods with a glycemic index less than 50. Now in South Africa, we are very privileged. So the dietitians in America are so jealous. So we have got a lab in Polokwane called the GI Foundation of South Africa. They've also got a website as well. They bring out bookmarkers and they are actually, with this movement of the GI in South Africa that is so big, they have classified all our foods into low GI, intermediate GI, and high GI foods. So, and they, they do it in a color coded way. So the green is the low GI, and they take three hours to release the glucose into the bloodstream. The intermediate GI foods is in an orange group, and they takes about an hour to release into the bloodstream. And the high GI foods takes 10 minutes, and that causes the spike that initially triggers a seizure. So, um, the fatty foods are encouraged and should be eaten at each meal and snacks because now a lot of people think, okay, it's more like normal eating, but they don't have that extra fat. So it's very important to, to show them and differentiate and tell them exactly how much fat they should have with every meal. Also, because we're working with glucose control now, 
I need to eat every three hours because if the, the length between the meals become too long, there's going to be proteolysis of the muscle. And the moment the muscle breaks down into fuel, you get glucose spikes as well. They've got normal amounts of protein that can be eaten. Also, no calorie restriction initially, but like I said, exactly the same with the modified Atkins regime. It's adjusted according to any weight changes. And then the vitamin and mineral supplements are necessary. So thank you so much for listening to my um, presentation. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me. Um, you can also ask the presenters um, if you would like my email address or my cell phone number. If there's something more you would like me to share with you, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Uh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tashka. It was wonderful and great comprehensive talk about uh, ketogenic diet, uh, modified Atkin diet, and uh, uh, low uh, index uh, glycemic diet. It's really great. Uh, thank you so much. It's only uh, my pleasure. Yeah, we, we learned a lot. Uh, it's great. We are actually uh, uh, using it in, uh, in our patient in Saudi Arabia. It works wonderfully. It's oh, fantastic. Wonderful. That's great to hear. Yeah. 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 So I have uh, some questions uh, uh, yes. from uh, the audience. Um, uh, they are thanking for excellent presentation again. And Thank they are... So they are asking about uh, if you have a resource for more standardized regimen to wean the diet. And they said in their center, uh, they wean it quicker than six months. So there isn't really a standardized um, regime for, for weaning off the diet. It's, it's more like a gut feel and looking at the client. So I had this one little girl, um, she was seizure free completely. And suddenly we saw this breakthroughs. And I said to the mom, but I don't understand what's happening. Oh, ketone values are good, but the glucose is spiking a bit. And it came to such a point that the dad actually put in cameras in the house. And she went to, after her mom and dad had supper, she went to the dustbin and she started eating their food. And then I said to them, okay, we need to win and we need to win faster because this child is literally just going to eat something out of the fridge and out of the, of the dustbins. So it, it, it literally depends on the patient itself. Um, if I wean off a patient and I drop with a 0 0.5 ratio and it, it's all great for a week, then I will probably drop with another 0 0.2. But the moment I see there's a breakthrough, I tell them, okay, we need to wait for a bit. Let's just stabilize for a week or two, then we drop again. So there isn't really a standardized regime. I take every patient as it is, start weaning off the diet with the smaller increments and see how they react to that. And according to their reaction, I would determine, okay, can I do it a bit faster or do I need to do it a bit slower? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, also in our center, we we need over a few months, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm, we are really careful to win it. Fast. <laughs> exactly, because two years mm -hmm. is a long time to be on the diet and mess it up so fast. So it is like really like medication that need mm -hmm. to be weaned off very very closely and uh, uh, very slowly. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other question is, uh, in the absence of L-carnitine crystal uh, form, would you yes. consider if, if L-carnitine crystal is not available, uh, would you consider carnitor? Yes, just, we just don't have carnitor in South Africa. So carnitor is perfect. Okay. It's carnitor is a pure L-carnitine. It's just we don't have it available in South Africa. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Ghaib also is uh, thanking for wonderful presentation and he had two questions. Are there any challenges or limitation for long-term use of ketogenic diets uh, uh, in your practice? No, so the thing is, um, it depends on the medical condition of the patient. So if I'm sitting with a GLUT1 deficiency, that child or patient is going to be on a type of a version of the ketogenic diet for the rest of his life. So you cannot really wean the diet off. Um, then in some of my cases, like a PDH deficiency, and then I've seen in some of my cases, but where there's some brain damage as well, that if they're on the ketogenic diet, their behavior is better, they're more responsive, they, their seizures are less. But the moment we start weaning off the diet, the, the 
everything starts acting up again. So there is some of my kids, a very small amount, but there is some of my kids that are on the diet for more than two years. So it all depends on the type of fragility and the type of condition that the child has got or the adult has got. So, but usually the adults I've never done really long term. And I think it's just because of the compliance. They just find it too difficult. It's much easier for a child, for a parent to say, this is what you're supposed to eat and that's it. But the adult has got so much choices. Mm -hmm. What's the longest uh, time you use the diet? So I've got a, a glute one deficiency child and she's been on the diet for 10 years now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I mind you, one as well. I've got a PDH, have, uh... a PDH deficiency as well and she's been on the diet for 13 years now. So she's a teenager now since, since birth and she's now 13 years old. Mm -hmm. We do have actually patients, for example, uh, HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, they have refractory seizures and they loved it and they didn't yeah. want to. We, I have they don't want to go off mm. on it uh, for six years and they love it really. Mm. As, long, as long as you keep the biochemical markers and you monitor and you keep it at bay and you see, okay, everything is still stable, there's no reason why they couldn't be on the ketogenic diet for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second question of Dr. Ghaib uh, uh, is, is, is it true that there is not recommended for elderly people or uh, middle age since it may intake, uh, induce uh, redistribution of fat in the body, which may induce stroke or infarction? Okay, according to me, that's a myth because I've got a few uh, middle-aged people and adults. The, what you should keep in mind, though, is that if they've got hypercholesterolemia, the diet is contraindicated because then you are going to get the risk for that. So then I would rather put that type of patient on the low GI adapted diet. So it's more about the glucose control. But um, if the I've, I've got some adults that's older, that's uh, I think my oldest patient was 57 or something, and she did it for a period of two years for the seizure and everything was fine. The cholesterol levels were perfect. We managed the types of fat she could eat well, the carnitine helped with the cholesterol. And then when she weaned off the diet, she was fine. So I see no reason why it depends on if it's severe epilepsy or is it for what type of reason, but any, any of the three diets we can definitely use. And that's where the point comes in where I like the familiarity of having a calorie restriction because if somebody doesn't have a calorie restriction with the modified Atkins or so on, and they just go insane with all the fats, they are going to have a very crazy distribution of fats and visceral fat and so on. So I prefer to tell them this is the amount of the exchanges of fats you can have and the proteins and the carbohydrates, just to have a little bit more of a borderline and make sure you're a little bit more in control. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there is uh, another question. Um, as you said that uh, low uh, glycemic index diet to be taken every few hours to prevent muscle lysis, does the same apply to ketogenic diet and modified Atkins diet? Okay, no. So that does not apply because when we focus on the glucose metabolism, because the body can only get fuel from the food every three hours, we need to have that regular feeding. But the moment you move on to the modified Atkins and ketogenic diet, you mimic starvation. So you don't want the body to think there's a good, there's a lot of fuel available. So then we usually do three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and supper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fauzia from our center, she's asking uh, a question, um, thanking you again for wonderful presentation. Thank and you. Uh, the question is, are you using L-carnitine with all patients receiving ketogenic diet or only if patient develop hypercholesterolemia? No, I do it with all my patients because the nice thing with the L-carnitine is also it supports the liver. So if they're on the anti-epileptic drugs as well, it supports the liver as well. And it, and, and it keeps the kids into ketosis. So all my kids and all my patients are on the carnitine. Yeah, I, I give it irrespective. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, in mechanical ventilation. Any recommendation avoid seizure and poor nutrition? Um... I hope I understand the question correctly. In the mechanical ventilation, there must be some sort of a tube feed, I assume. So then we've got um, ketogenic formulas like ketocal. And then we can, I would also just maybe start with a lower ratio, just because it's a fragile condition, monitor all the, the bloods and so on. And then you can decide to what ratio you can do. But no, with a, with a um, mechanical ventilation, you can still implement the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. 
uh, another question I want to learn about immune system situation of patient during ketogenic diet regime okay unfortunately I don't have a lot of knowledge about that um, I, I can't answer you about that I, I really I don't know I don't I, I haven't implemented autoimmune diseases with the ketogenic diet at all I don't know if you but maybe I feel have. like maybe maybe there the question if I understand it well uh, is that immune system will be same as or oh, yes. low yes. immune or oh absolutely because remember whatever we are missing we're giving with the supplementation and that's why the supplements are so important so um even though the foods are lacking we're making up with the supplementation to make sure that all the micronutrients and minerals are still being taken in mm -hmm. uh how can the ketogenic diet be implemented where you you uh, where there is no dietitian <laughs> very difficult no. uh, ketogenic diet no modified Atkins possibly because you can work with exchanges and tell them you know you can have so many proteins or you can have and low GI but ketogenic I, I would I would not recommend doing it without a dietitian or a doctor who has knowledge about doing it yeah. Do you it's, just, it's, just, it's just too dangerous if that if they're going to ketoacidosis or hypoglycemia you know, it's it's near. It's a risk I wouldn't be able to take. Yeah, there's no way to do it without <laughs> dietitian. Really, <Yeah. laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, do you admit all patients for ketogenic diet? Admit. Yeah, admit them. No, I don't admit any of my none of them. So that's why I said so in in, in, in children. Not even in children. So one of my neurologists said to me that. Um, he didn't like the fact that the, the kids were so traumatized and the medical aids in South Africa is crazy. They don't want to pay for it. And then we found the studies to show that they don't have to be admitted. So that's why it's so important. I give my patients the glucometers. So I prep them before the time. Then I give them the ketogenic diets and they're like on my phone 24 seven on WhatsApp or whatever. And then I tell them you give to do the diet after this amount of time. I want you to measure the ketones and the glucose. So I've got direct indications of what the blood values are. So I don't do admission of the kids at all completely. And I've got wonderful results. Yeah, actually, we still admit uh, really? patients. Really? Yeah. In our really and some of them, they are developing hypoglycemia. So it is like um, kind of uh, scary. Or, uh, so the, uh, I've had one or two with hypos, but um, because I'm on my phone the whole time, if they would tell me the glucose falls below three, I would tell them, give them 20 moles of fruit juice, wait 10 minutes, and then read the reading again. And then if it goes like that, the next time I would adapt their recipes to a lower ratio and more calories, then it brings the glucose levels up again. Do you so do I follow them some investigation? Uh, for, for example, I have a patient who was on uh, uh, admitted uh, and uh, uh, I usually do electrolytes twice during the week of admission. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, it wasn't done on the ice. Uh, on the day of discharge, uh, we did it. And my carb was 13. You? Yeah. So okay. we gave him some sodium bicarb and uh, some supplement. He was fine. Clinically, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was, he was yeah. fine. So... We are like facing some cases like this. Okay. I think the only way I would say it, at the way that must be admitted is the infants. I will never start the ketogenic diet on an infant if the baby is not in the hospital and we've stabilized ketone and glucose levels. If that is stabilized, the parents can go home. But with my, my kids older than a year and even adolescents and adults, I've never admitted. Mm -hmm. But little little children, you, you will admit. No. Like one year, one year. Uh, one no, so obviously year. one year. So, so if the patients come to me like at the age of two years or three years, I, I don't admit and I don't have any issues. Mm -hmm. I think it's because I'm in such good contact with the parents and they know they're allowed okay. to phone me like 24 hours. It's not a question. I've only got office hours. So they're available 24 seven to me. Yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. good, Danny. I mean, like also communicating with the patient all the time, 24 exactly. hours. Exactly. This is very important also. Yeah, because they feel lost and it's such, a, it's such a crazy diet. Until they feel comfortable, then everything is much better. Mm -hmm. uh, have, you, how, have you used with adults as opposed to kids much? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've, uh, not as much. So my adults are probably, it's about... 
30% of my practice and then 70% is children. And it's literally because of compliance. So I come, they come to me and they tell me they want to do it. And the moment they hear what the modified Atkins or whatever it entails, it's like, okay, but can't I have alcohol? And what do I do when I'm eating out? And what I, they just don't comply. And then, so that's, that's literally the reason why it's lower. And I must also say in South Africa, our adult neurologists don't believe in the ketogenic diet. It's only the pediatric neurologists that done all the research and know each other. And they all know everyone working around the ketogenic diet, but the, the adult neurologists don't believe in the diet. So they literally don't send their patients for that. Mm -hmm. How do you check the compliance of keto diet? Because okay, so one of two ways: there's either seizures, or you check the glucose and the ketone values. Yeah, <laughs> you can't lie. If you give me a value and the glucose is six, it's like nap. There's no good compliance there <laughs> because it's a normal glucose level. Mm. And you do it every time he comes to the clinic. No, I give them glucometers, so we sponsor it to him. So that's why it's easy for me not to admit, because each and every single patient of mine get a glucometer to measure the blood glucose and the blood ketones at home. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, one of the attendees thanking you for a great lecture, and she would like to have your contact. I'm more than welcome. Can Jessica maybe send it to them? I, I think she can. Yeah, my email address, my cell phone number, no worries at all. Uh, for how long we can continue the keto diet? So like I said, the average is two years, but depending on the condition, depending on the weaning off, it can be a little bit longer than two years. Mm -hmm. And how do you decide uh, if you have uh, to keep subject on modified Atkin diet or low glycemic index diet? So the, I've, when, when usually with the adults and the adolescents, when I, and I've got one or two kids as well, because they just, there was just no way I could do the ketogenic diet, they, they wouldn't take the high fat content, is they became seizure free. So I've got about three or four kids on the low glycemic index diet that's seizure free. So then um, I, I'd stay on that. There's no reason why I would go stricter or even with a modified Atkins diet. Um, so it depends on, on the parents or the, the patient's perspectives as well. So if they're on the modified Atkins, they say to me, yes, I want to get a driver's license, but I'm still having one or two seizures a month. I can't get the driver's license. I would say, okay, let's do, instead of modified, let's go to keto and make it stricter and see what happens. So it's all about feedback from the patients and what the expectations are and the results that I see that would determine what type of diet and how long they would be on that. But in general, even with modified Atkins and the low GI one, it's also a period of two years. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for a great talk. Uh, the question is, can uh, uh, she's asking, can we start my, her own uh, five-year-old yeah. son on low uh, glycemic index diet on their own, do we need a dietitian on, bro on board? Uh, how safe is it? Any side effect? How can we get more info? On that? Okay, so the wonderful thing about the low glycemic index diet, it's something the whole family can do because it includes starches and it includes balanced meals and it includes snacks. The only thing is the portion sizes that's going to differ. So this is the safest um, type of diet of all three diets because we have to look at the, um, the, 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 the rate of release of the glucose. Where she can get a lot of information, she goes to matthewsfriends.org. They've got all the information on the low GI diets there as well. So even if she does something wrong, there's nothing that can go wrong. It might just be that the portion size is too big and she's getting a breakthrough in seizure activity. But the low GI diet is the easiest one to do. And obviously, it would be best to go with the dietitian because they will tell you portion sizes, what foods are low GI, what is high GI. But it's, it's not as restrictive as the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for a great presentation. How effective is ketogenic diet for adults with intractable epilepsy? Same as the kids. So I've got same. I've got about three or four adults who seizure free on the ketogenic diet. So it depends. It, it just depends. Yeah, it's like any anti-epileptic drug. Or you never know. Are you going to be a good responder? You're not going to be a good responder. So it's something you have to try, and we do it for a period of three months. And then after three months, that's the period they've shown you get the most efficacy. If we see, okay, we've got a great reduction, then you decide, okay, I'm going to continue or I'm not going to continue. And then you wean off or you continue. But um, yeah, my adults react fantastically. I've got a few, few clients that's seizure free.
it's actually uh, it's amazing i mean in kids uh, um, some we have some who are seizure free but uh, we do have like uh, great seizure reduction yeah so, yeah yeah but uh, having seizure free is not as frequent uh, often yeah um, yeah uh, the question is uh, is ketogenic diet uh, recommended only uh, for severe uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy? So no. so that's the benefit in South Africa. So um, I understand in um, Europe, you have to be approved to be on the ketogenic diet. In South Africa, you don't. Um, they can contact me and tell me they want to be on the ketogenic diet. And I just need to make contact with the neurologist and tell them, listen, are you on par with this? We're going to start the diet. So um, if you've got severe seizures, we would do keto. If it's like seizures and it's not like irritating once or twice a month, then we would do the low GI diet. So, um, yeah. Uh, do patients continue their anti-seizure medication while on the ketogenic diet? Yes, because I'm not a neurologist. You cannot, um, I cannot touch anything of the medication. But what the ideal is, if the seizure starts to decrease and we get a stabilization, they are supposed to slowly decrease the medication dosages as well because they didn't work in the first place. So, but that's up to the neurologist. I don't have control over that. But I've got a good relationship with my neurologist and we tell them, listen, yeah, can you please maybe just wean this one off a bit or that one off a bit and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, we do actually. Most of them, they need the medication, definitely. We yeah. may reduce uh, the dose a little bit if the seizure is well controlled, uh, mm. but most of the time they will need anti seizure medication mm. with the diet. It, it, especially in the first year, I must say the neurologists don't really taper off with the medication the first year, but usually after the first year, they taper off and the kids do wonderful. They do fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's your take on effect of keto diet in gut microbiota? Um, it's fantastic because this is one hypothesis to um, say that the gut microbiota actually um, changes the environment and activates certain genes that helps with suppression of seizures. So it's a hypothesis. It's just when you do the probiotics and um, because now we don't have a lot of fiber in the diet. Um, I would I, I suggest probiotics for my patients on a daily basis, just as long as there's no prebiotics in it. Mm -hmm. At what point or period should you consider reducing drug dose for a patient who has had no seizure for six months after initiating the keto? Oh, absolutely. After that, if he's gone seizure free for six months, I would definitely talk to the neurologist. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please share? For seizure reduction, which one is more effective, modified Atkin diet or low glycemic index diet? Okay, so which age group? Okay, so obviously the stricter you go, the better efficacy. But but that hasn't been shown in research. The research showed that the modified Atkins and the ketogenic diet has got exactly the same efficacy. So um, it would I would do the modified Atkins diet um, and the low GI diet, depending also on the needs of the patients and so on. And uh, uh, for example, if you start the, the keto diet, patient did not improve uh, at all. Uh, for how long do you keep him on that? Oh no, so three months. If there's no improvement after three months, then we start weaning off. What's your experience with refractory status epilepticus and ketogenic diet? So what happens, I've only had, I've actually haven't had one kid, but the problem is what some of the parents, and I explain it to them so carefully, I'll give them like a bunch of loads of handouts, is I tell them um, that it's a forced metabolism. So it's like almost changing your uh, petrol engine to a diesel engine. So you're sitting with this forced metabolism, and what happens is if somebody feels sorry, it's like, you know, like a little bit of a sweet tea or a little bit of a cookie is not going to make a difference the body grabs up that glucose in such an instant that they go into status. So that's the only way on the ketogenic diet where they can go into status. I've got a few kids that was in status that the, the neurologist said, please, let's try the ketogenic diet. And they didn't go into status again. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have an experience in uh, ICU that is very difficult to find ketosis or to reach the ketosis? Not really. I must say sometimes I had to go to a really high ratio because it depends on um, the medication and sometimes the nurses give glucose drops and uh, instead of saline drops and then it messes up everything. Um, but 
that my parents, and I don't know how your hospitals work, but in our hospital settings, the parents are allowed to take the kids their own meals so they don't have to eat the hospital foods. So they can still work with their individualized program and take the food to the children. Or if the adults want to make their own foods, they can eat it themselves so then, I, then you actually get better control. Or I see you can do a formula feed then, the keto cow. Mm -hmm. The highest ratio you reached is four to one. Five to one. I had a child, five to one, and this, I promise you the child's ketones were 3.9. It never even went higher than 3.9. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, everybody is thanking you for wonderful yes, yes, data data again, honey. Um, uh, how can we consider ketogenic diet for our patient in remote area? Yeah, is it that's risky to do it to do this? It's risky. <laughs> because you're not going to have a glucometer to measure the ketones and the glucose. I would, I would then rather go for a carb restriction and low GI, but not keto modified Atkins. It's, it's just too dangerous. I, I wouldn't go there. Uh, can ketogenic diet be offered to new needs or pregnant women? Yes, you can. And um, if you look at the website, matthewsprints.org, um, they will, they have a whole section there, there on pregnancy and the ketogenic diets. And like I said, the neonates, you can still do it, provided you, you adapt the regime. It must be a very low ratio. It must be more regular feeding, high, um, high calories and so on. Yeah, for example, patients who had like uh, epileptic encephalopathies and uh, they have very, very refractory seizures, I mean, refractory seizures mm -hmm. during the neonatal period. Yeah. So uh, medication is not working. So Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, the question is, name the website for uh, the low uh, glycemic index. Okay, uh, so it's matthewsprings.org. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type it in there. Um, and all three types of, di of, of diets are there. Uh, yeah, sorry, oh, it's dark. Uh, just see, and that must be a point. As I, that's the website. Okay, thank you. Uh, is it safe for diabetic patients? Uh, for the because they are more exposed to hypoglycemia. It's, 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 yeah, it depends on the patient because I wouldn't really put a diabetic on such a strict diet just to treat diabetes. So in theory, yes, but then there can't be any contraindications that the, the diabetic person can't have any cholesterol levels or high cholesterol or anything like that. Um, I would prefer doing the low GI diet with my diabetics. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't really see diabetics with a ketogenic diet, but it is possible. But to go to that extremes and measuring off everything and working from a recipe, I think there's easier way to treat the diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the predictors of poor seizure control in drug-resistant epilepsy patients? Um, how do, oh, okay, so what happens is is that we have found that any external stress can actually be a potential trigger. Um, it can be emotions. So I had this one little girl, she was seizure free, and her dad and them kept her at home and she was safe. And then they said, Okay, but she's been so good, they're gonna take her to the ocean, gonna take her to the sea. And she was so excited that that triggered a seizure. So we see, and another kid of mine got bitten by a dog that triggered a seizure. So when they are ill, then they definitely get breakthroughs. When they get immunizations, they get breakthroughs. When they get, um, some of my patients are seasonal as well, when there's extreme heat or extreme colds as well. And then, so any any onslaught from the outside can be a predictor for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, when's the right time to initiate the keto diet for seizure reduction? And what's the criteria to keep the subject on keto diet? Well, if it depends on me, <laughs> you must start it before the medication. <laughs> so it, it really depends. It depends on the neurologist when they feel, okay, they don't see any improvement with the, with the anti-epileptic drugs. And then... Um, they usually contact me. So it's either by word of mouth that patients come to me and tell me, can you please start the ketogenic diet because I hear this one's child's doing so well or the neurologist would, come, would refer a patient to me. Yeah. Uh, in UK, there has been very little information about the easier, uh, easier alternative to ketogenic diet that adults could try. 
could it be said that most adults with drug refractory epilepsy could look into uh, typing the low glycemic Absolutely. index type? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, would you recommend keto diet for patient with diabetes? As already Can we answered answer that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, where is um, and uh, again people are asking for your contact. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna. But Jessica, please, you must also. I would love to come to Jordan. <laughs> You had really it's wonderful talk. So you had many, many questions. I think this is the last question that uh, we have. What was the longest age diet you used, diet, uh, ketogenic diet? For example, infantile spasm, three months. 20 days. 20 days old. So, yeah. so it's that's a, from birth. It's from birth, birth a very early age. <laughs> yes. And even elderly, same. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really great talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Tashka. Um, I have here another question. Adult neurologists uh, don't promote keto or any of other diet uh, much in adult, even with drug resistant. Uh, and so very interactable seizure in UK too. Good to obtain your contact detail too, if possible. Uh, your neuro around, but not able to get dietitian to do. Uh, sounds like I have to commit uh, self. <laughs> so, yeah, you see, that's unfortunate. That even in South Africa, we are only two dietitians specializing in the ketogenic diet. It's not a diet that dietitians want to go in because they feel it's too dangerous. There's too many risks associated with it. But um, I'm, I've got an absolute passion for my kids. So, yeah, it's a no-brainer for me. Yeah. So it really uh, create a lot, a lot of questions uh, because, of, <laughs> because of your wonderful talk. Uh, so really, Thanks. really thank you very much. It's only my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. Great. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at the uh, at the end of this uh, uh, presentation, thank you again, uh, Dr. Tashka, for a great talk. Uh, 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 there are I would like to introduce the uh, Global Health in Epilepsy Project uh, database. So uh, the Global Health in Epilepsy Project database provides a registry of existing epilepsy projects uh, throughout Africa. Eastern Mediterranean region, as well as other regions. It's identify information such as project lo uh, location, institutional partner, project scope, uh, funding uh, sources, and volunteer need. The database uh, is quite quick and easy to complete. By submitting information in your project, you inform uh, an understanding of the effort that occurring throughout the world to narrow epilepsy treatment gap. The database will provide you an opportunity to learn from other and to exp explore collaboration opportunities that might strengthen your own work as well as that of the sector. Furthermore, the database will allow people from different areas such as government, academic, nonprofit, and uh, to learn about existing effort while offering a, me a mean to engage. Uh, on the next slide, uh, please uh, scan the QR uh, code to re receive your certificate. Also, there is a link in the chat box now to uh, get the certificate. And thank you very much all for uh, listening. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Tashka. Thank you, organizers. Uh, thank you all the audience uh, for to be with us uh, in this Friday evening. Uh, it was great uh, uh, webinar for, for all every, everybody. Fantastic. Good night, everybody, and have a nice weekend.
Okay, good night. Good night.